If you Google me today, <laughs> you, won't hear, uh, you won't read anything about my uh, 10 years as a trial lawyer, uh, or the fact that I worked in the Lindsay administration, uh, or that I was the um, de facto inspector general of the MTA, or that I became the first uh, commissioner of transportation in Westchester County and uh, formed the bus system there. Um, uh, or that I was responsible for the electrification of the Upper Harlem Railroad line, uh, or that I introduced uh, light rail to St. Louis, or that I was the uh, project manager for uh, the United Nations Development Project that assessed the uh, value and worth, viability of uh, a dozen or so uh, multimodal transportation projects in Moscow. What you'll read is that I uh, took movies of the Washington DC streetcars that later became a documentary before Congress ordered their discontinuance and conversion to buses. And you'll read that 50 years ago, I won the contest for the Transit Authority's uh, uh, map contest uh, here in New York City. But the story doesn't start 50 years ago. It starts 84 years ago. For the first 14 years of my life, I was, um, um, lived in a brownstone, two-family brownstone owned by my grandparents in the Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn on 64th Street between 4th and 5th Avenues. Under 4th Avenue, a half block away, ran the 4th Avenue local and the Sea Beach Express, uh, as they do today, the N and the R lines. Uh, and uh, in fact, at 64th Street, oops, at 64th Street, the Sea Beach Line took a turn away from 4th Avenue and came out into an open cut right across the street from where I lived. Now, while I couldn't see the trains from my uh, window, uh, I could hear them every two or three minutes with their motors accelerating to come up the hill from under 4th Avenue or their brakes applying as they went down the hill to go to under 4th Avenue on their way to Times Square. On 5th Avenue, a half a block away, was the busy 5th Avenue line that started in downtown Brooklyn and ran to the terminal at 100th Street, Fort Hamilton, where the Verrazano Bridge is now. A block the other way, over 3rd Avenue, was the 3rd Avenue elevated line that ran from Brooklyn Bridge to its terminal at 65th Street and 3rd Avenue. And if you look at the right-hand corner, you'll see PS 118, where I went to school as a kid. And uh, on 3rd Avenue itself, there was not one or two, but four trolley lines. The 3rd Avenue, the uh, Hamilton Avenue, and here you see the 86th Street and the um, Bay Ridge Avenue line at their turnaround terminal, at, right at 64th Street and 3rd Avenue. So is it any wonder that I turned out to really fall in love with streetcars and subways, or, or that uh, at that time I didn't know it, but that my career would wind up in the field of urban transportation. That's number one. Number two is that um, I was always interested in cartography. And um, uh, I would pour through maps and atlases. I'd love to look at street uh, drawings and things like that. And when I was uh, uh, idle, I would draw maps, but they were a particular kind of map. They were track maps, maps of showing which uh, trains ran on what tracks, where the switches were, where the station platforms were, that sort of thing. So that's number two. Number three was that in junior high school, at the age of 12, while the girls were doing homemaking, sewing, cooking, that sort of thing, the boys took carpentry and also letterpress printing. That's where you take small pieces of type out of boxes called cases and you set them in composing sticks and then put them in a printing press and print with ink. And I said to myself, someday when I own a house, I'd like to have a printing press. I just fell in love with the craft. Well, um, my house, uh, in my house I now have 10 printing presses, <laughs> like, like this one. Uh, which is a, a big uh, Chandler and Price uh, press, just like the one I, I learned at. And uh, uh, I print things like this, a three-dimensional pop-up, 
that I did for the October 1994 calendar, uh, commemorating the 90th anniversary of the subway system, which, as Peter said, uh, started uh, 111 years ago today, even replete with a 1904 Liberty, Liberty Head nickel there. Let's uh, jump ahead to 1963. I met the love of my wife, Mary Ann, and um, she hails from Niagara Falls. So the following year, we went up to Niagara Falls with our a newborn daughter, Michelle, who's also here, to uh, introduce her to her grandparents. And somehow while I was up there, I chanced upon an article in the New York Daily News. It's a newspaper I never read. The article was only about three inches long, but somehow my eye caught it. Uh, if that's a question of fate, that's a question of fate. But the article said that the, New York, that the New York City Transit Authority was sponsoring a contest for the design of new subway and bus maps. Well, I said, geez, you know, I've had this idea in my head for a long time about how to try to simplify the New York City transit maps. Because up to that time, all the maps were of the by the individual companies. There were three companies here, as many of you know. The Interborough Rapid Transit Company that started in 1904, the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Company that started in 1915. In fact, the uh, October 22nd of this year marked the 100th anniversary of that. And then the independent subway system that was not only built by the city, but also operated by the city through its Board of Transportation. So each of these companies was actually competing with one another, and they only showed uh, the, their own routes on their own maps. Now, although the other two companies were taken over by the city in 1940, still the, uh, the maps that, uh, that showed all of the lines showed them in only three colors, depending on which company the original line belonged to. And uh, as Peter indicated, there are a lot of complexities in our system. Lines join one another and then they separate out and you don't know whether this one comes in that way or it goes out that way. So I had the idea of just color coding them, giving each one its own individual color so that a passenger could trace it from start to finish. So I wrote to the transit authority for a request for proposal. I went to a local art store up in Niagara Falls and bought a box of colored pencils and a tracing pad, pad of tracing paper, and I started the project. Now, color coding is, is uh, old in the city in a way. People think that, that maybe mine was the first. It wasn't, but they were very different kinds of things, and I thought you'd be interested in some of them. This is an original map of the Interboro Rapid Transit Company, the IRT. It used two colors. It used uh, red and blue. The um, uh, red was for a subway line, a line that ran underground, although in its extremities in the Bronx and in Brooklyn, it came out into the open uh, and an elevated structure. The red color was used for a line that the IRT defined as a line that never went into the subway. Um, and uh, an interesting thing that I'll come back to later on, if I can point to this, You see here on uh, Westchester Avenue and also in Queens, those lines are red and blue because in both of those cases, the subway comes out into the open and runs along with the elevated lines. Now, why this was important for the IRT to convey this to the public, I'm not sure. And why uh, the different colors for subway and elevated, I don't know. Maybe if you were told to go to the 96th Street station, when you got to 96th Street, you, if, if the um, line was um, blue, you would know to look for a staircase going down. And if it was red, maybe you'd look for a staircase going up. I don't know. But that was the, the way the IRT did it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let's see. Nope. Okay. Here is the BMT's map. Now, it used color coding too. This time it was red and black. The black was used for a line that was underground level. It did not have to be in subway as long as it was below the ground. 
And for example, the, the sea beach line that I showed you a few minutes ago it was out in the open, but underground level. The red was if the line was above the ground, and it didn't matter whether it was on a steel structure or on an embankment. But that's how they differentiated it. Why that was important to the public, I don't know. But you'll look and see, and if I can do this again, the Brighton line here. It's elevated as it comes out of Coney Island, but at, uh, at Avenue M, it goes down below the ground in an open cut and ultimately in the subway. And you'll notice that when the line gets to the Manhattan Bridge, it obviously comes above the ground and the line turns red. So that had nothing to do with color coding the line, but was instead conveying a geographic bit of information to the public. Also, uh, the BMT showed by the thickness of the line the number of tracks on the line. The very thinnest lines were two tracks, which was the minimum. If the line was a little bit thicker, there were three tracks. Under Fourth Avenue that I referred to uh, before, if I can do that again. Uh, well, Fourth Avenue, and it, 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 let's see here. Here, and the Sea Beach line that I showed you before, it's thick and shows four tracks. And at the Stillwell Avenue terminal, there are eight tracks, and the line is the thickest there. Again, was this information that helped the passenger travel from one point to another. I doubt it, but that's, that was the color coding that they used. Now the most unique one though, was this one of the IND, the, 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 the system that the city built and operated itself. There was true color coding as we use it in my concept. But no one knew of this map until months and months after the subway map contest was over. I think that that's rather interesting. <laughs> and uh, I'll point out to you uh, the trunk, if I can aim this there. It, this is the 8th Avenue trunk. The 6th Avenue subway wasn't built yet. You'll notice that at a local station like this, there is a dot on the one line where that uh, line stopped. But on the red line, there is no dot because that line is an express line and it doesn't stop at that station. That's a concept that I used in my map, although I was totally unaware of it here in this one. And it's a concept that was followed by Massimo Vignelli in his famous map of 1972 and it became known as the concept of no dot, no stop. Bear that in mind. Uh, there he is again. <laughs> Who gave him a ticket? <laughs> the most famous map was, was the Hagstrom map. It showed all three lines, uh, all, the lines of all three companies, because it didn't operate anything at, on its own. Uh, but again, it, what it did was to use only three colors, as I said before. It really is an invasion from outer space. <laughs> well, at this, at this point, uh, I sent away for the, um, for the um, specifications for the contest, and the transit authority sent me back a big packet. And when I read it, my heart kind of sank. The information was obviously meant for professional cartographers. It was very, very technical. There had to be a certain amount of overlays. There had to be registration marks. I had to put in a cost estimate of what a map like this would cost in certain volumes of printing. And I said, geez, I can't do this. You know, I have an idea, um, uh, uh, so what do I do with it? Well, I uh, wrote to the uh, Hagstrom Map Company and asked for a meeting with its president, Andrew Hagstrom. And he was very nice, he welcomed me. And I said to him, um, are you aware that the Transit Authority has, uh, uh, is sponsoring a contest for a new subway map? And he said, yeah, yes, he was. And I said, um, well, I have an idea, but I'm not a professional cartographer, and uh, I wonder if you would like to team up. Now, um, I was a thin young lad at that time, and he was a 
heavy set uh, chap, uh, twice my age and twice my size. And he leaned over his wide desk and in his very charming Swedish accent said, there is no map better than my map. <laughs> and that quickly ended the conversation. <laughs> so I was on my own. And I decided uh, also there was a specification that required you to be, to design both a subway and a bus map. And again, I said, well, you know, the, bus, the subway map is going to be difficult enough for me to present. Uh, I can't do the bus map. Uh, I'll submit what I can, and um, if they disqualify me, they disqualify me. Uh, as it turned out, obviously, they didn't. So what I did was to uh, uh, put uh, pieces, pieces of tracing paper over the Hagstrom map, and on my way back and forth to work on the old uh, steam coaches that had generous two, two uh, seats on each aisle, I could spread out, and I would keep drawing these maps with the challenge that I had of not having any two lines that I chose to have the same color come in conflict with one another, come in contact with one another. And it was just a trial and error thing. At times I'd get to do two or three routes without a problem and then I'd run into a problem, I'd have to take the tracing paper off and start all over again. Here are a couple of them that um, that wound up pretty complete before I ran into a problem. But when I finally came to a, a, a system of a selection of certain colors for certain routes that didn't conflict, I then had the challenge of putting it down on paper. Um, another thing that the requirements, uh, contest requirements uh, required was that the map had to go from uh, midtown Manhattan to and including downtown Brooklyn. And I said to myself, well, the idea that I have is not going to be understood in just that small area. I'm going to have to do the whole map from the whole system. And so I bought a large, uh, detailed street map of the city of New York, and over it I put a big sheet of mylar and hand drew the entire system from the tip of the Bronx all the way down to the um, uh, bottom of the Rockaways. This is a blow up of, uh, I, uh, let me jump ahead of it. Um, uh, Peter Lloyd was very anxious for me to find that map. And in all of his searches at the Transit Authority, they had no, they did not keep any of the maps. In fact, the only thing that he found in the Transit Authority's archives was the 19 page report that I wrote uh, to accompany the map, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so, uh, but then a year ago, uh, it's in September, I found at the bottom of a carton of papers that I was looking through in the basement of my home, this framed copy uh, of, of a, a color um, of, the, of the map. Um, I gave it to a friend of mine, um, Steve Vavaro here in the audience, who has a very high efficiency scanner. He scanned it in high resolution and sent it over to England uh, to Peter. And Peter almost flipped out as I did. And he said, Raleigh, do you realize that you found this map 50 years almost to the day when the contest ended? Here is a, um, here is a blow up of that uh, map that you just saw. Very hazy and whatnot. Here is a slightly cleaned up version of it that Reka Komali used, or, or did, but she couldn't really do anything further with it either. So Reka asked me, can I redraw your map using vector graphics? And that's what she did, and that's the map that you'll see outside. Uh, and uh, as Reka did section by section, um, first of all, I was in absolute amazement at her craftsmanship. And secondly, it was like seeing my map reborn. And there, there it is.
Now, the map uh, specifications required that the map be geographic. The maps of the city of New York had been generally geographic, the transit maps, the Hagstrom map. The map immediately preceding the um, contest was, a, was the first schematic map that the city had, and it was done by a fellow named George Solomon. It uh, pretty much was patterned after Harry Beck's map of the London Underground, but again, it used only three colors. But for some reason, the city wanted to be geographic this time. And so I even went to the extent of having Manhattan slanted, because the, uh, the uh, avenues of Manhattan do not go north and south, they go really southwest to northeast. So I said, if the Transit Authority wants a geographic map, I'm going to give it to them absolutely geographically. But I also realized something else, and that is that with 16 separate routes going north and south on Manhattan Island, it would be impossible to put the lines side by side with one another. That's what I would have preferred to have done, as Peter showed you on his diagrams. I would have preferred that they go side by side, separate. But I wound up having to put them uh, in groups. And so because of my operational knowledge of the transit system, I put the locals on one line and the expresses on another. So if there were two local lines, said, say red and green, I put them in squares, red, green, red, green, red, green, like you saw on that old IRT map. And the same thing with the expresses. So for example, five lines on Broadway got reduced to two, just express and local. That allowed me to do what I showed you on the IND map, too, to put a dot on the local line, but not on the express line. So you could visually see right away what lines stopped at a station or what lines bypassed it because they were expresses. Uh, this is the uh, cover or the kin index of the report that I wrote. One of the first things I pointed out in the report was that this is a unified system. Operate it that way. Show it on your maps that way. It's, uh, the system was unified in 1940. It's now 24 years later, 1964. Stop referring to it by BMT and IRT. Stop all this interdivisional stuff. The public doesn't care about this. They want to just pay their fare and go from where they are to where they want to go. I made a comparison of the systems in Paris and London. And I showed that in London there are eight routes serving 310 stations and they use eight colors, one for each route. Paris, 15 routes, and they use eight colors. And New York, my God, 34 routes and only three colors. <laughs> so as I wrote on page four of the report, and the, the conclusion is inescapable that maps of New York's subways are trying to make too few colors do too much work. And that's the operative phrase in the report and the one that's often quoted uh, at, uh, in reports about the history of this, uh, of this map. Believe me, I am pressing the forward button. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the map had to be submitted on, um, uh, uh, by September 25th. I went down to the Transit Authority and handed my map and report in in person. There were 11 contestants who submitted maps, uh, who, who entered the contest. Very quickly afterwards, on October 2nd, we got a letter that my uh, uh, design had been accepted. Now, according to the rules of the contest, if a design was accepted, that entitled the entrant to $3,000. Um, this is a letter from Mayor Wagner to uh, me. Uh, 
uh, on October 8th, acknowledging that the, uh, congratulating me for the, um, for the map. That letter also said that a final decision would be made by October 9th. Uh, actually, the October 9th came and went, and so did the 10th and the 11th. And shortly afterwards, each of the three of us, there was a husband and wife, so I'll count them as one, uh, were individually contacted and asked to go down to the Transit Authority. And um, uh, we were in, brought in individually, and we uh, were asked if the Transit Authority should decide to split the top prize three ways, would you object? And each of us, remembering that old adage that uh, one in the hand is worth two in the bush, we all said yes. And so within a few days after that, uh, the final award was made and we each got an additional $1,000. There's the check for $4,000. which is worth $30,000, $700 today. Actually, it's worth a lot more because I bought my wife a new kitchen, got her a new kitchen in our house, but it persuaded me that although I liked practicing law very much, I would prefer to be in transportation much more. So it was a career-changing event for me. The conclusion of the map, uh, at the conclusion of the report, I wrote something that Peter will elaborate on in a minute. And that was, I, I said, I sincerely hope that the proposed design, either in the, origi either in the original form presented herewith, or as it may be modified or adapted by those with wider experience, may assist New Yorkers and strangers alike to travel uh, you know, more easily. And that's uh, what happened, and as I said, Peter will go into the details of that. I want to jump ahead to... I know, there must be a magic phrase. Aha. Uh -huh. The 1967 1967, when the first map after the contest was issued. This was it. I was obviously very pleased that my concept of color coding had been adopted. And I was very pleased, too, to see that the individual routes were um, shown line by line, side by side with one another, rather than braiding that red, green, red, green thing that I described. That's the way I would have preferred it because I'm convinced, I was convinced then and I'm convinced to this day that with the geography of New York, we cannot show the individual routes side by side in any meaningful, clear way without distorting geography. So if we want a geographic map, we have to do something else, which is what happened in 1979 uh, that John Toranak will talk about, uh, or we have to do a schematic kind of version, uh, distort geography. But what I was horrified was, was that even though the lines were color-coded, they were interrupted all over the place, first by these big white boxes that denoted the stations. And in the station, in those white boxes were the letters or numbers of the routes that stopped at that station. Totally unnecessary if they had followed the no dot, no stop uh, concept. But then, to make matters even worse, there were certain stations, a number of them, that were called interdivisional transfer points. Points that if you went from a station on one of, the uh, one of the lines of one of the old original companies and transferred to lines on, um, uh, that belonged originally to another company, that was called an interdivisional transfer. And that was indicated by a, an even bigger white, a bigger box surrounding the white boxes and the colored pink or red. To me, it looked as though somebody took a box of strawberries and threw it at the map. <laughs> so, um, at that time, I was in the Lindsay administration.
and I got hold of a transit authority wall map and a couple of bottles of typewriter whiteout. <laughs> and I cleaned the map up as much as I could, gave it to the transit authority, and uh, said, this is what you can do without doing violence to anything. <laughs> and they came out with the map the following year, um, which is uh, uh, obviously a lot, a lot cleaner. But uh, Dr. Ronan, who was very, uh, the chairman of the MTA at that time, uh, was very much uh, enamored of the color coding concept but he really didn't like this map uh, for all that much. And that's when he turned to Unimark International, and that's when uh, Massimo Vignelli got into the picture. And there's the genius that only uh, a man like Massimo can bring to the theme. When I saw that map, I said, my gosh, this is the uh, essence of the concept that I had in mind. But only, as I say, only a genius like Massimo could pull that off. Clear, bold, strong lines, um, uh, it, it, wide, that you can see them side by side clearly, nothing to interrupt the flow of the line. But unfortunately, while a lot of um, cities all around the world, people are used to reading diagrammatic uh, transit maps, in New York City, uh, it fell into disfavor, and it was replaced in 1979 by a more geographic map, and the color coding concept, though continued, takes a different form uh, of color coding by trunk. And that's today's, uh, in essence, today's map. Uh, that's uh, Vignelli's uh, 2008 map using the trunk color concept, but it's showing individual lines. And I'll have more to say about that during the discussion period later on, the panel discussion. I'll leave you with this slide and ask you to bear it in mind for later on. There we see a chap looking at this newfangled thing called a book that just came off the printing press. And he says, nice, but as long as there are readers, there will be scrolls. Thank you very much. <laughs>